All right, everybody. Uh, I think we could get started now. Um, people are still registering as we talk, uh, so they'll join us as they do. Um, but I think it's about time for us to get ready so that we have time to get through everything. So um, thanks for joining us for another Roebling Road Trip. Ro Roebling Road Trip. Um, and a big thank you to everyone who made a donation when they registered. We're trying our best to offer all of our programs, especially the virtual ones, as a, on a pay what you wish basis, so that we can support our community, but also just to make sure that everyone who's interested can access our programs and join us. So like all donations of any amount really do help our museum so that we can host these great programs and continue to collect and preserve Roebling's history. So an introduction of me, my name is Lynn Kalania and I'm the executive director. I've stopped saying that I'm the new executive director if you've been in all of these. It's, I started right before the pandemic hit, so I'm not new anymore, but uh, I have been since then having a great time learning about the town of Roebling, the history, the people who lived here and still live here. And these virtual programs really have been a big help in teaching me about Roebling's history, and getting like a, a national perspective on the impact of the Roebling Company. So for those of you who haven't visited yet, the Roebling Museum is located in a former company town named Roebling, New Jersey, which is in central New Jersey on the Delaware River. Um, we are a company town and is listed on the National Register. Uh, so the, the town itself was built in 1905. And I say that it's about 98% intact architecturally, only one building burned down and one was moved, but it didn't displace another building. So I think that's about 98%. Uh, so our museum is in one of the former uh, factory buildings uh, and the, the town itself, if, for those of you who aren't that familiar with the Roebling Company, they uh, produced and built some of the most iconic suspension bridges that we all have the pleasure of driving over. Um, at our museum, we have indoor and outdoor exhibits where we bring to life the story of the people who lived and worked in the company town. And we've been offering really great uh, walking tours on Saturdays. So I do uh, encourage you all to stop by for a visit. Now the weather's getting nice. So today, though, we're going on a rolling road trip. And for those of you who are first timers, this Roebling Road Trip series, it's a virtual program uh, that takes viewers around the country to visit with people who study Roebling stuff in other areas or run Roebling related historic sites. So, so far we've been to Cincinnati, the Allegheny Portage Railroad, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge, and we're uh, June 16th is gonna be our next Roebling Road Trip. And we're gonna be learning about the um, there's a rolling structure that was built for the 1964 World's Fair in New York. So that's one that we really haven't talked a lot about, but we're very excited to get uh, some more information about that site and to meet with those folks. Um, and then we've got a couple of other things in the works that if you're on our mailing list or I mean our email list or a newsletter list, um, you'll hear about those coming up soon. So for today, how this is going to work is uh, our guest, Ashley, she's going to give her talk. And while she's talking, you guys, please start submitting questions. If something occurs to you or if you're seeing something in her slides that really speaks to you and you want to ask a question, don't wait to the end. Um, just type them in because I will be managing the Q&A section um, and also the chat. So some people prefer the chat. I'll be looking at both. Um, and then at the end, we'll do uh, q and I'll, I'll bring, her question, bring questions to Ashley uh, and we'll We'll go through those. So uh, before I keep talking throughout the entire program, I'm going to kick it over to Ashley. Are you ready to go? I am. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. I'm super happy to be here talking for the Roebling Museum or with the Roebling Museum. Um, I've never actually been there, and it is uh, one of uh, my goals this summer to get there. So today, I'm going to talk about the life and work of Emily Warren Roebling. And before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit about who I am. I, by day, am a fourth grade teacher. I've been teaching in New York City schools for over a decade. Um, and when I'm not in the classroom, I am a New York City tour guide licensed. And my specialty is the Brooklyn Bridge and the history of the subway, Lower Manhattan, South Street Seaport, that sort of era and history has always fascinated me. 
And so my public historian work centers around that, but I also do costumed interpretation of Emily Roebling, where I visit school children all over New York City in character and in costume, pretending to be Emily uh, for second graders, because most second graders do study the bridge and New York City history. And um, a little tidbit about that, once I introduced myself, I said, hello, I'm Emily Roebling and I'm 175 years old. And this little second grader said, you look really good for your age. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be able to bring this history to uh, young New Yorkers. But I do also love talking to grownups, which I know that most of you are. And so without further ado, we'll get into the history of Emily. Um, my notes are next to me on my iPad. So you will see me glancing at that because technical issues. Um, before we start talking about Emily, and her life and her work, I want us to just remember the era in which she lived. We're talking about the 19th century, the mid to late 19th century. Um, this was a time when women couldn't vote, they could not manage their own finances, and under the laws of coverture, essentially they were just an extension of their husbands. They were not even necessarily their own person. And it's important to know that from her early childhood, Emily Warren, as she was before she married into the Roebling family, did not fall into this role easily. And I hope as you listen to her story and the things that she did throughout her life, you'll consider that all of this was being done in a time when it wasn't normally done by women. Um, so here's New York's original power couple. Um, that is Washington Roebling and his wife, Emily. Um, these are two portraits painted by French artists and they hang in the Brooklyn Museum. They hang right next to each other. Um, and even, I'm just gonna ask as you take a look at these portraits, just notice the differences and similarities. That's the latent museum educator in me talking, but we're not gonna dwell on this too long because we're gonna go back further in time to Cold Spring, New York which is where Emily was born. And now Cold Spring, for those who might not know, is about an hour north of New York City. Um, it's a little hamlet on the Hudson River. And when you Google the word bucolic, literally the images that come up are of this area. So it is one of the most beautiful parts of New York and remains to this day a very sweet little town. But we're going back into the mid 18th century um, when this photograph was taken. And this is from the Putnam History Museum to, to sort of put us in the head of where Emily was. Now, the first people we need to meet are her parents. This is the only image I have ever been able to find in all my archival research of Bibi and Sylvanus Warren. Now, her father was a New York State Assemblyman. He was very powerful. They were a upper middle class family in New York. And their house still stands. It is on a street called Fair Street, just off Main Street in beautiful little Cold Spring. And I was just telling Lynn that this is a, this is a Google Maps photo, but I have been to this house. I went up there actually on Emily Roebling's birthday a few years ago and was just checking out the town. And the woman who owns the house, I had done a little research and I knew who it was. Um, she was out on her porch. And so I reached out and said, hey, I am a public historian and I study the life of Emily Roebling. And she immediately invited me inside her house and gave me a tour and it was fabulous. And we've been in touch a couple of times since then. So the house still stands and the Warrens had this house built in the 1940s. Now, again, they were a family of means. Um, Sylvanus was a direct descendant um, from the Mayflower Warrens and they had money, but money does not take care of everything. And the children of Phoebe and Syl Sylvanus, there was a dozen of them, Emily being the 11th out of 12. And something that's important to realize, again, the context of the time, six of their children died before Emily was even born. In childhood, they died. And so to, to create sort of the world that she's born into. Emily's born in 1843 and she had siblings dying up until 1841 and only six siblings remain. The old of which, oldest of which is her brother, 
Governor Kimball Warren. Now that's a very strange name. He was named after a family friend um, and he was affectionately referred to as GK throughout most of his life. Um, so she did come from a family that had already known its fair share of tragedy. This is uh, GK in his Civil War photos. Um, he was a civil engineer, meaning that he built things and major general. And he was very close to Emily because he was so many years her senior, he was almost like an additional parental figure to her and really looked out for her. Now, as a child, Emily was known for riding her horse too fast. Um, she was very precocious and her brother GK saw that she probably should continue her education beyond the time when women or, or girls normally would during this era. So he actually enrolled Emily at what is known as the Georgetown Visitation Covenant Co Convent, excuse me. It's still in Georgetown, Washington, DC today. It was a private all girls school and it was considered higher education for teenage girls in a time when only the smallest minority of women got any secondary education. So Emily, as a teenager, moves to Washington, D.C. to live at Georgetown Visitation. And there she takes classes on the things that Victorian women typically would. She's taking painting classes, embroidery, watercolor. She's learning to play the piano. Um, and she's also learning housekeeping things and domestic affairs. Now, this is an actual picture from Georgetown Visitation during the era, era that Emily would have been there. Um, but oops, let me go back. The other thing that she got to do at Georgetown Visitation was study things that were beyond what most girls got to do, which was geology and chemistry, astronomy, meteorology, bookkeeping, algebra, history, French, geography. So here they are in a science class and you can actually see one of the nuns over to the left. And these young women are getting an education that very few did. And Emily ends up graduating in 1860 with highest honors and an award called the Crown and Gold Medal. And to this day, she's regarded as one of Visitation's most famous alumna. Um, and so what do you do after you graduate with honors and you're a young Victorian woman? You go home <laughs> to your hometown, uh, back to Cold Spring, where she is for a couple of years and she's courting and leading her social life as a young woman until her older brother, GK, invites her down to a military ball. Now, it's February 1864. The Civil War is still very much happening. And Emily goes to this party, this ball, and meets Washington Roebling. Now, he is a young Civil War soldier who had spent a generous amount of time at RPI, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, where he learned to build bridges like his father. John Roebling. Um, after RPI, he enlisted in the military where he continued to build bridges for the Union Army. Now, as a side note, Washington Roebling was engaged in the Second Bull Run Battle, Antietam, Chancellorsville, the Wilderness, Siege of Petersburg, and Gettysburg. It is a miracle that this man survived without massive injury, all of those battles in the Civil War. He eventually becomes a colonel. Now, Emily walks into the room and it's a little bit like that moment in Hamilton where everything stops when, the, when Hamilton sees you know, his love. That is essentially what happened when these two met. Um, it was described as love at first sight and she was witty. She could light up a room. She could hold her own socially. He was a little bit shyer but they hit it off big time. And in fact, he wrote to his sister right after and said, I am very much of the opinion that she has captured your brother Washi's heart at last. It was a real attack in force. It came without any warning or previous realization on my part of such an occurrence taking place. And it was therefore all the more successful. And I assure you that it gives me the greatest pleasure to say that I have succumbed. Now, don't go like a great big goose and show this letter to everyone, will you? That's what he wrote to his sister, Elvira. 
And, you know, he had a joking nature in his letters and as did Emily. And so they courted for a year, often writing letters back and forth constantly. She sent him some pictures of herself. He did not like them. <laughs> He wrote to her, if you keep getting much thinner, you will soon be nothing but a mess of bones. And I really have serious doubts about taking you now. Our bargain, you remember, was that you would not weigh less than 154 pounds. Just weigh yourself quick and let me know if it is less. Should it be the case, then I would advise you to contemplate the enclosed picture and grow fat at once. So this is a little precursor of their relationship. They teased each other. Some of the letters that they wrote back and forth are absolutely hilarious and um, body, dare I say. <laughs> Emily did ask Washington to burn her correspondence, lest it fall into the wrong hands. And unfortunately for us and for the archive, he did. So we do not have her letters to him. But luckily, Emily saved Washington's letters. And so we can tell the nature of their courtship. And they were married in 1865. And it was a double wedding. Emily's brother, Edgar, also was part of the wedding. He married his sweetheart. And this happened in Cold Spring at a church that's still there. And then Washington and Emily moved to Trenton. But they weren't there for long. Because in comes John Roebling. John Roebling is about to build a bridge in Cincinnati and he's asked Wash to help him. And so Washington moves out there with the intention of leaving Emily behind. He says to her um, that, you know, everything here is black, black. No amount of washing keeps the hands clean. You wouldn't want to be out here. But Emily, ever the strong woman, is like, I want to be where the action is. And she insists on moving to Cincinnati. So John Roebling and Washington acquiesce and Emily moves out there despite being told by her husband, your purple and white silk check dress is going to be as black as your black silk dress in just a week. Emily did fine in Cincinnati. And uh, this portrait for, of um, John Roebling, the father is from the Smithsonian Gallery. And it's probably the portrait that we see most of the father, John. Now, as Washington is working, on the Cincinnati Bridge and Emily is with him being a socialite. John says, I'm gonna go work on my next project. I'm designing a bridge to cross the East River and it will be a world record setter, the longest suspension bridge. The year is 1867. And John says that he wants Washington to help him with this bridge as well. So in order to do so, John sends Washington to Europe to study the latest in pneumatic caisson engineering, which is part of the bridge building technology that John Roebling, the father, wants to employ for the Brooklyn Bridge. At the time, it was called the East River Bridge. Now, Emily, ever our adventurer, insists on joining Washington in Europe. She's like, you're going to Europe? You Please take me with you, um, despite being pregnant with their first and only child. So John foots the bill and Washington and Emily set off to Europe to learn about caissons and bridge science. Unfortunately for Emily, she finds out that she's violently seasick and her trip across the Atlantic is absolutely miserable. Luckily for her, she recovers quickly. And Washington hops around Europe a bit. Emily stays mostly in the town of Mulhausen, Germany. And it is here that an accident happens where she falls down a flight of stairs while heavily pregnant, a long flight of stairs and lands on a stone paver at the bottom. And she's injured pretty badly. And she goes on bed rest. Luckily, despite giving birth to a 12 pound baby, yeah, you heard that right. Um, both mother and son, come out okay, except shortly after the delivery, Emily starts bleeding very heavily and they realize that these are complications from her previous fall and she is not okay. She spends the next several weeks on bed rest, trying to get well enough to get out of bed. Um, she finally does and they are able to sail back 
to Brooklyn or to New York and um, the young family heads to Brooklyn. And it's there that John Roebling and Washington Roebling really start working on this idea of the East River Bridge, this record-breaking suspension bridge. Emily is tending to, at this point, a baby who's almost a year old and very rambunctious. And John and Washington are standing, and this is a story that if you're a Roebling fan, you're probably very familiar with it already. They're standing on the, the ferry or the ferry dock in Brooklyn, kind of where we think of Fulton Ferry Landing now. And a ferry like the one in the picture is coming towards them very quickly. And John does not get out of the way in time. And the ferry smashes the dock and his foot. And he ends up having to get several toes amputated and is taken to Emily and Washington's house nearby where he then re refuses all medical treatment and within a couple of weeks goes into septic shock and tetanus and dies a horrible violent death in Emily's home, all while Emily is tending to a toddler and trying to keep the toddler quiet because her father-in-law is dying in the other room. And he dies in July of 19, 1869 and ground has not been broken on the bridge yet. And at age 32, Washington Roebling becomes the chief engineer of the Brooklyn Bridge Project. And he says, here I was suddenly put in charge of the most stupendous engineering structure of the age. The prop on which I had hitherto leaned had fallen, his father. Henceforth, I must rely on myself. At first I thought I would succumb, but I had a strong tower to lean upon, my wife a woman of infinite tact and wisest counsel. Now this, we know that Emily and Washington had a very playful relationship, but this is documentation of the fact that Washington revered this woman. He thought of her as brilliant. He understood that she held power in her own way. Now, the bridge gets started and the pneumatic caissons are built. And for those who may not know about caissons, imagine um, a giant wooden box open at the top and then you flip it over. And that box is sunk to the bottom of the East River. So it becomes a platform upon which they can build the bridge towers. Now, as the caisson sinks, they're having to haul mud and rock up through to literally create a hole for the caisson to sink into. Unfortunately, you might have heard of the bends, which is something that divers coming up too fast out of a pressurized environment experience. And that is nitrogen bubbles in the blood causing extreme pain, um, muscle weakness, joint problems. And in some cases, the complications can lead to death. And a lot of the workers were getting sick in the caissons. And one of them was John, or excuse me, Washington Roebling, who insisted on working near and with the people who were building his bridge. Um, not only was he getting bouts of the bends, but there were a series of accidents and problems that were bringing distress to Emily's husband. Um, there was a fire in the caissons. The Manhattan caisson took so long to reach bedrock and in fact never did. It, the Manhattan bridge tower rests on sand to this day. Um, and the caissons disease ended up sending Washington to bed for a decade. Um, we know now that he probably also suffered from debilitating anxiety and likely depression during all of this because of the pressure that was on him. But he ended up heading to, after, a, I'll read you a quote actually, let me say. Emily wrote that one afternoon, in the spring of 1872, Colonel Roebling was brought up out of the New York caisson, nearly insensible. And all of that one night, his death was hourly expected. Um, they really did think that they were gonna lose their second chief engineer. And he recovered enough to be able to sit up and communicate, but not enough to go down to the bridge site. And so, 
It was decided that Washington and Emily and their baby son, John, who was named after his grandfather, would travel to Germany to go to a historic, what would we, we would think of today as a wellness spa where there were healing waters, hydrotherapy to help Washington recover. Um, spoiler alert, it did not necessarily help him recover. And they ended up coming back to the United States that fall. They purchased this house, um, Columbia Heights, 110 Street. It's no longer there, unfortunately. But the doctor said, Washington, you're too sick. You can't even be there near the bridge. Go home to Jersey. So Emily and Washington went home to Jersey. But in Trenton, while he was in Trenton, the towers of the bridge are going up and they're being built. Emily was found at that bridge site all the time communicating things from her husband who could not even see the bridge and what was happening. She was relaying information. She was checking the status of construction. She was making sure that orders were coming and going, checking on safety. She was the communication between Washington and his actual project. And I always love to show this because whenever you read about Emily Roebling, they talk about her, her, grasp of mathematics and how she really understood science and geometry and, and calculus. And they always mention this. They always mention catenary curves. Emily Roblin could calculate catenary curves. Great. A catenary curve is the droop in a wire when it's suspended from two points. But let's remember, Emily's education was far beyond most women of her era. And she did have command of advanced math techniques. And she was able to confidently discuss these plans. She was able to assist in problem solving. This project in the end took 14 years. And over the course of 14 years, there was changes along the way. Emily was discussing with Washington, making decisions. There was times when Washington couldn't write or read because his eyesight was so bad. So he would dictate to Emily and she would scribe and translate in a way that it could be taken to others on the work site. And so every piece of information is being funneled through this woman who absolutely understands what's happening. And not to mention, she was also with Washington when he was studying the caissons. Um, let's go to, so there's the, the technical aspect of build, building the bridge, but then there's the sort of more social aspect. And on more than one occasion, Emily used one of her superpowers, one of her gifts, which was persuasive social prowess. And she used that to convince men of much higher stature because they were men, um, men in charge of the bridge in various roles. She used them, her power to get her way on a variety of things, suppliers, contractors, politicians, board members. She consistently owned the room and did so with ease. And let's see, let me keep going here. Um, this wooden footbridge on the not yet complete Brooklyn Bridge, East River Bridge at this time, was temporarily in place for workers. On more than one occasion, Emily walked this bridge and at one point toasted champagne on the other side of it. Now, this was the bridge where sometimes reporters would try to cross this and not make it across and they would fall to their knees and crawl back to the other side. Um, Many people were not as brave as she. Now, the bridge, at this point, it had gotten a lot of bad press. Um, it was over budget by a lot. It was over time. And the master mechanic, Frank Farrington, he went on a bit of a publicity tour of sorts to promote the bridge. Everything's fine. It's super safe. It's glorious. Washington Roebling's a genius. Um, and it's rumored, though I'm very careful to say I have never seen proof, it is rumored that Emily wrote most of the speeches that master mechanic Frank Farrington gave. So once again, we see this woman who is highly educated, knows what it takes to get stuff done, and she's also a publicist. Um, the day of the bridge opening. So here you see the trustees of the New York and Brooklyn Bridge request the presence of guests for the opening ceremonies. And this is May 24th of 1883. This invitation was printed by Tiffany and Company. 
and you can still find them on eBay for several hundreds of dollars, but I'm more interested in showing you this invitation. Now, this particular invitation, I will tell you, is held in the collection at the New York Historical Society, and it was listed as a Brooklyn Bridge invitation, and I went to the archive thinking I was going to see this. I was very excited. And then the archivist pulls this out. And after I got used to reading her handwriting, I realized this was also an invitation written on Emily's monogrammed stationery, which was also printed by Tiffany and Company. And it says, my dear Mrs. Wilson, I wish you would make one of my party of ladies to attend the public ceremony of the opening of the big bridge. I want the ladies to meet at my house at one o'clock on Thursday. And so in a procession across to the bridge, sort of, an opposition to the presidential procession on the New York side, you know? Wear short dress and bonnet, as I shall, even at the reception. I want you to help me receive after the public performance is over. Yours affectionately, Emily W. Roblin, 110 Columbia Heights, May 17th, 1883. And I thought, there's so much contained in this one little letter. She's saying that she is going to wear her short dress and bonnet, and that she wants to walk in opposition to the president of the United States on the opening day of the bridge with her gaggle of girls. And I just thought, oh, this just really tells us who she is, uh, a bit of a spitfire. Then as I was taking photos of this particular document, I realized that this stationery is bordered in black and women's formal stationery carried a lot of messages during this era. And if it was bordered in black, it meant that she was in mourning. And typically you would use your mourning stationery only if someone very close to you had died and you would use it for a year. So that even if you were corresponding something delightful, people would know that you were still mourning the loss of a family member. And this was in an era when, you know, mass communication was still letters for the most part. Um, so I went back and I checked the timeline of Emily's life and her family. And it was her older brother, GK, who passed away the August prior to the bridge opening. Um, he was huge in her life. And so the hidden message of the black border and the fact that she was in mourning, even at one of the most joyous and celebratory times of her life really struck me. Um, let's go to opening night. So we have this grand display of fireworks, such as New York had never seen. And it was well acknowledged that Emily was a huge part of this. She was the first person to cross the entire span of the bridge. And I know everyone knows this. She carried a rooster as a symbol of victory. Been studying this woman a long time, still not quite sure why the rooster is in this, but uh, I do know someone who has a tattoo of Emily and her rooster. Um, so this was 139 years ago, this month that the bridge opened and the city effectively shut down. It was a huge celebration. School was closed. I mean, think of Times Square at New Year's. That's what this was. It was huge. And President Chester A. Arthur, after he made his way from the New York side, remember, to the Brooklyn side, came to Emily's house uh, in celebration at the reception. And there was, he commented on how great the music was and how beautiful her flowers were, which is high praise for a woman. But also let's remember this woman is part of why that bridge was standing. Washington was still not well, but he did come down to meet the president and then retreated back to his room on opening day of his bridge. Um, so what do you do after you've created one of the greatest structures in the world? Well, you go back to Jersey and that's what the Roblings did. So Emily and Washington returned to New Jersey to lead a quieter life, except, you know, even though Emily's getting older, she's still, she's a society lady. She wants to be out doing things. And so she decides that she's going to travel some more. And I love that I found this document, which is her uh, passport document. And you can see that she's filled out Emily Warren Roebling, April, 1896. She's going to Europe. And this is a great little piece of information, a little nugget. I hereby certify, I know that the above named Emily Warren Roebling personally, I know him is crossed out and her is written. 
and it happens twice. And I don't, I think based on the handwriting that it's the person who filled out the form, but I just love that it's the late 19th century and someone was like, take your him out of here. I'm a woman. Um, so this was what she used to exit the country. And then upon arrival into, uh, I think she arrived into London. You can see that she was solemnly swear. She was born in Cold Spring, Emily Warren Roebling. And in the very last line, and that I desire the passport for the purpose of, and she has just written traveling on the continent. That's a very broad thing to do. Great. Can't wait to see what you do, Emily. Well, she had a lot of plans, ladies and gentlemen. At this point, Emily was quite famous and she was well connected. So she does her 1896 traveling the continent tour where she is received by Queen Victoria at court in England. She is present for the coronation of Tsar Nicholas in Russia. And she has her formal portrait, the one that hangs in Brooklyn Museum, painted in Paris. Now the dress that she is wearing is also quite famous. It is held in the collection at the Met Museum and it has only ever been on display once. And she, Emily loved this dress. And I will tell you that the Costume Institute at the Met, the people who work there told me that this dress is, and I can't remember the exact words, but it's a little weird. Like apparently Emily probably designed it and put all the things that she wanted into it. And it wasn't necessarily known as like the height of fashion, but there you go. We also discovered that the colors of yellow and purple are the colors of the women's suffrage movement, which I'll talk about a little more in detail in a minute. But Emily loved this dress so much that she had her portrait painted in it as well as wearing it to all her fancy functions in Europe. And I did get to see the dress at the Met. Um, going to the Costume Institute is really interesting. It's, they lay everything out on a table and you're not allowed to touch it or look at it in the wrong way. But that cape, that purple cape that we see her wearing in the picture and the portrait is thick, like a big thick quilt. So I, I think it would be really nice to touch it, but I was not allowed to. <laughs> so the, dress was donated. You can see it says it was probably American, made in 1896. It was an anonymous gift in memory of Mrs. John Roebling in 1970. Now, it's important to note at this point that Emily wasn't just traveling around Europe meeting famous people. She was an active member of the DAR, the Daughters of the American Revolution. Um, she was actually asked to be president of the DAR and declined. She was a member of many society clubs all across New York. She fought for women's suffrage in a time, she, she did not even live to see women obtain the right to vote. So she was doing the work well before the work was achieving anything. Um, during the Spanish American war, she helped design a field hospital on Long Island for injured soldiers. But even that was not enough. This woman who had defied the odds and gone to school at a time when a lot of women didn't get educated, who married a brilliant man and helped him build an iconic landmark, who traveled Europe meeting famous people, who did all of this, decided that she wanted to go to NYU law school. Now, the law school that she attended at NYU, she was the second class of women to be offered what was called a law certificate. She did not become a lawyer. She was not trying cases. NYU opened up this program to help women of means be able to manage their estate. Emily, excited that here's yet another thing that women weren't necessarily allowed to do, became the second graduate, part of the second graduating class of this, this NYU group. And she writes this essay called A Wife's Disabilities. And this essay got a lot of attention and I'm gonna read you part of it. In her essay, Ms. Roebling said, under the old common law, a married woman was classed singular with parties incompetent, infants, lunatics, spendthrifts, drunkards, outlaws, aliens, slaves, and seamen. As a single woman, this incompetency did not exist 
but the sacred right of marriage conferred upon her the honor of ranking in legal responsibility with idiots and slaves. Super powerful essay. It's been reprinted many times. She's hearkening back to that old coverture law, the law that says a woman is not her own once she's married and that her life is not her own. And up until her last years, Emily was, I would say salty is a light way to say it. She was very salty about this. Um, her legacy, this, this, this letter is one of my favorites too. In a letter to her son, she says, I'm still feeling well enough to stoutly maintain against all critics, including my only son, that I have more brains, common sense, and know-how generally than any two engineers, civil or uncivil, that I have ever met. And but for me, the Brooklyn Bridge would never have had the name of Roebling in any way connected with it. It's true. There were times when they wanted to oust Washington Roebling from being civil engineer. And Emily, with her social prowess and ability to command a room was able to convince them not to. Um, Emily died in 1903. She was only 59. And she, it is said that she died of stomach cancer. Her doctors, however, said that um, she had led a life of too much excitement and that had contributed to her demise. I think that would probably really not made her happy to hear that. Her headstone is beautiful and the words gifted, noble and true were inscribed at the request of Washington. Though he did remarry after Emily passed, he is buried next to her. They are together, those gorgeous headstones in Cold Spring overlooking the hills. And Emily's legacy continues to evolve. There's a plaque on the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, it's hard to read in the photo, so there's just translation. I have mixed feelings about the plaque. It says, uh, builders of the bridge dedicated to the memory of Emily Warren Roebling, whose faith and courage helped her stricken husband Washington Roebling complete the construction of the bridge. Faith and courage, yes, but there was more than that. She was a very capable, smart, intelligent woman who suffered no fools. And I think this plaque doesn't do all the justice that she deserves. This is a really important passage that I want to share with you. Um, Erica Wagner, she wrote Chief Engineer, which is an excellent biography of Washington Roebling, and I highly recommend it. Um, Erica had this to say about Emily. Although badly affected by decompression sickness, Washington Roebling was always in command of the work. Emily Roebling's role in assisting her husband was a crucial one. There is no doubt that she was extremely well acquainted both with the technical details and the political matters that ensured the completion of the bridge. Washington would always acknowledge how important her contribution had been. There is, however, no evidence to support the claim that Emily Roebling completed the bridge. We are obliged to look as hard as we can for evidence that supports what we wish to believe. If we don't find such evidence, we must abandon our faith in that tale, however attractive it once it might have once seemed. I think this is really important because Emily's story has been reduced in some ways to first female engineer. And it is true that she had the skills of an engineer, but it is also true that she absolutely was not an engineer. And the bridge would not have been built without her, but she is not the sole builder of the bridge. And I think when we're chasing the truth in history, we have to be, we have to be really careful that it's not either or. Like, there are shades of gray. It can be both. And we can acknowledge that her life was incredible and that this bridge would not have stood without her. But she was not the chief engineer. Um, RPI, Washington's, um, Washington's alma mater, and also his son, John's alma mater, said, among the first women leaders in the management of technology, say, they, they say management, Emily stepped in when Washington Roebling fell ill. 
as his unofficial aide de camp and exerted a profound influence over the construction of the bridge. She carried out all written communication and face-to-face -face interviews with contractors with a thorough grasp of the engineering. And she was inducted into the RPI Hall of Fame in September of 98, where they gave her the title of manager, not engineer, but manager. And I, I, think, I think that one works. Um, the street that held their house is now called Emily Warren Roebling Way. And the dedication ceremony for this, this name change was attended by her great-great-grandson, as well as her great-great-great-grandsons, who are the only current living heirs to this couple. Um, and finally, those of you who live in Brooklyn or New York know that this area underneath, directly underneath the Brooklyn Bridge was not pretty. And we couldn't go there for many years. It was absolutely unsightly construction zone, as long as I've lived in New York anyway. And now it is the Emily Warren Roebling Plaza and it opened of December of last year. And I think it's a really, really fitting tribute to this woman who broke so many glass ceilings in so many ways. And as her legacy continues to be interpreted differently and involves, we should just remember that she's a powerful figure in American history and one whose story deserves to be told. And that is all I have for you guys tonight. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Ashley. I'm trying to balance all the chats and the questions that are coming in. So if any of you have any questions, start typing them in the Q&A box. Um, Lynn, um, should I stop sharing my screen? Sure. Okay, so we have one here from Mark, when he says, I've never read or heard that gender played a negative role in the relationship between Emily and the workers. Was that an issue that you heard about? I have not heard about on the work site itself. Um, I don't think that the, act, the, the, the physical laborers really were having that much contact with her. I do know that as visitors were coming to the house to speak with Washington, initially, when she was like, I'm sorry, you'll need to talk to me. Initially that was like met with some skepticism, but because she was so capable, quickly proved herself and instantly gained the trust of those who she was in communication with. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and relatedly, we have another question, and I don't know how you might get at this, but did Emily go to the site on the Brooklyn Bridge in a dress or in pants? No, because she was always in a dress. In those winds, that would be really difficult. Don't she would never, difficult. a woman of that era would never have been caught in, in pants and under those circumstances. I kind of knew that was going to be the answer, but still, <laughs> I'm thinking about it, and I wouldn't even want to be on that. I mean, women right have been wearing dresses for most of human existence, so. During wars and everything. <laughs> okay, so here's uh, a good one, and I'd love to hear your answer to this. Um, this person is saying that you have an incredible array of documents, uh, and that you really took a look at, uh, you know, kind of everyday things, published essays, gravestones, letters, photos, clothing. Um, can you share more about how you got into this and how you started to hunt for these sorts of sources that are kind of off the beaten path? Yeah, I, so many, many years ago, I was teaching second grade and we did a bridge study and I had always loved the bridge and the story of it. And I, I just didn't, I didn't really know a lot. Um, and I started learning on my own. So the Ken Burns documentary about the Brooklyn Bridge is near and dear to my heart. And really that sort of set me on the path of it. And I think part of it is that I had moved to New York. I moved to New York 15 years ago and walking across the bridge was one of the first things that made me feel like a New Yorker. And I just kept digging. And I have to say, I'm a nerd for old things, um, just in general, as a, as a public historian. And chasing history is is a high <laughs> that I enjoy so for instance when I saw like at New York Historical Society they're like Brooklyn Bridge invitation it's like yay for the first time I get to see one in person I, I have to tell you when she, the woman the archivist brought out that letter that Emily had written by hand and I was like I can touch this um I I was so surprised and excited and the, again like seeing her her grave for the first time was so wonderful getting to see her dress I think those people at the Met Costume Institute thought that I was just an absolute dork I was so excited 
I know exactly what that feels like. And <laughs> I'm going to just give a quick like insider tip here. Those passport documents, y'all, I went to Ancestry.com. <laughs> I was like, what do the Roblings have on Ancestry? Low and listen, listen, <laughs> I have a Roebling family tree on my ancestry. Okay. Yeah. I think we might just be the same kind of nerd here, but I think <laughs> it's also, I recognize your research and your, the way that you're going at it as clearly like public history museum style research too, like the everyday, um, as well as, you know, like she may not have been covered in books in the same way that, you know, a, a rich white gentleman of the time would have been. Um, so you kind of have to hunt in these other places. And I'm so yeah. glad to have that dress. I think that one of the things that why I'm a history teacher is because a lot of us grew up feeling like history was something over there that was about dead people and dates. And the more I started to learn about history that I found interesting, the more I realized this was real people. This was where people who loved things and lost things and felt things and they used everyday stuff like we do. And so it's, I think that's what led me into public history is being able to interpret it for others. Every, I, I did a podcast um, called the joy project a few weeks ago by Krista Avampato. And I talked about my love of history and what's so cool about it is everyone has, everything has a history. You want to know about the history of Nintendo? Rock on, go find out, because I'm sure it's interesting. <laughs> okay, um, do you, have you come across any audio of Emily's voice? Um, we gotta find it though, right? When I, that's an excellent research question, as I would say to my students. <laughs> Where is her portrait hanging? In the Brooklyn Museum, next to her husband. It is on the, third or fourth floor, whatever floor it is that has that huge, big, beautiful open area where sometimes concerts are and stuff. Um, yeah, it is, I have sat there many, many a day. They're huge, huge portraits, like floor to ceiling. We have some more dress questions. <laughs> Please. <laughs> what is a short dress that she wore to counter the presidential walk of the Brooklyn Bridge? It would think of it as more like a less formal dress. So in, in the event of like a grand, oh, say a bridge opening, um, you would be wearing a very formal gown that would be, would go quite to the floor. A short dress might show your ankles, you know, like maybe it's your day dress, you're walking in the park and you don't want to get yourself dirty, your hems dirty. So she was, I think it's safe to say that Emily, she's like, I'm walking across the bridge. I'm like doing things. I'm busy today, even though it's a special day. Like she was going to dress for the occasion. And it was springtime in New York, like it is now. Right. Um, when they went to Mulehausen, did they stay or live with John A. Roebling's family? There was That's where some, he's from, right? Yeah, there was some people who were family members. I don't know specifically without looking through the research which family members it were. Was they are credited with being very helpful during that terrible childbirth and time afterwards. It is said like thanks to the doctors and the family who could be present. Yeah, I mean, it's no coincidence that that's where they went, you know. It must have been for family reasons. Um, all right, so several people, and I think this is a good note to end on, have asked for more information about your walking tours in New York City. Um, so if you <laughs> want to talk about that or, or, or where you've done them in the past and what. Yeah, what so um, my walking tours, I, I did. So let's just acknowledge we've all been through a pandemic and I was not doing a lot of public walking tours during the pandemic. And now I'm ready to start up again. Basically, what I do is. Um, you can hire me privately to take you wherever, um, or the, I see that some people are asking like what company I worked for. The company that I worked for was called, um, untapped cities and they changed to untapped New York, but then the pandemic hit and I stopped working for them. Um, thank you. I see Krista says, write a book about Emily. Uh, so I have a website. It's hellosemric.com. 
and you can send me a message through there about booking tours. I do enjoy doing small groups. So if you like have friends coming and there's like five of you and you want to hear the history of the bridge, you can do that. I also do custom tours. If you're like, Ashley, can you create a Hamilton tour for us? Um, we, I can do that. I do specialize in lower Manhattan. So I don't do like a Central Park tour or anything like that. Um, it is it is the the 18th century Lower Manhattan that really gets me excited. Did you watch The Gilded Age? Now I'm just talking to you. This is not a question. That I <laughs> did watch the first episode of The Gilded Age, and you know what I thought? There is not enough horse manure on those streets. This is not an accurate depiction of New York. <laughs> I believe it. Um, yeah. All right. Well, this has been fantastic. Um, so just as a recap for those of you who are still here, um, all of these programs are, are recorded. So they will be on our YouTube if you want to share them with people or if you want to rewatch or whatever. Um, so definitely check that out. Uh, we usually send them out in an e-blast too. So if you're on our list, you'll get that. Um, and just FYI, lots of people said very nice things about you in the chat. So if you want to personally scroll back through there, I do recommend it. I did not read those out loud but they definitely happened and I completely agree you did such a good job thank you for your energy and enthusiasm for this topic thank you guys all right have a good night everybody bye